as our, our uh, speaker gets wired up. So do you all know what book of the Bible we've been studying um, with Pastor Paul Campbell? Anybody know what book of the Bible, please? Luke. Very good. Very good. Okay. So uh, the questions get harder. So last night we studied the parable of the Good Samaritan. Sunday morning, we studied the parable of the sower. Now, I was impressed by our speaker that last night he tied the parable of the Good Samaritan in with the passage that follows. Come on up. Come on. Come on. I'm just wasting time to get. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, what, what, anybody remember what comes after the the Good Samaritan, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Mary and Martha. You know, I never connected those. So there's something greater than being a Good Samaritan. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's, uh, that's good. Um, and I asked him a little bit about teaching in his youth ministry, and he's been, he's been kind of alternating between Gospels and Epistles yeah. or and uh, Old Testament, and then theology. Theology, yeah, right. So we get Luke. That's right. And, uh, thank you. Thank and you. Let's pray for you as you teach tonight. Please, thanks. Lord, we f we first thank you for Doctor Luke, who was one of your devoted followers. That by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he he took the time and the effort to write down for us this account of the life of Jesus, doing it very carefully, but also deliberately to teach us what we need to know about him and about your truth. Thank you for uh, the Holy Spirit that inspired him. Thank you for uh, Paul Campbell who's come to teach us from the book of Luke, and I pray that, that as he teaches, the Holy Spirit would be our teacher as well. And we would be learning together uh, how to be followers of Christ. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Thanks, Pastor Paul. Well, oh, perfect. Thanks. Looks like it. Same color. Okay. Um, uh, any, any questions from the last couple of uh, messages or any other random questions? you might have for me. Any questions from um, Luke? Where were we? Luke 10? Last night? All right. Well, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12 tonight. <coughs> Luke chapter 12. If you want to turn there, Luke chapter 12. And we'll spend some time there, and um, in this first half, we'll, we'll, we'll get going to Luke chapter 12, and then I'd like to jump to, if, if time permits, I'd like to jump to a passage in Colossians that I think will be really helpful for us to think through one of the big points in here. And um, there's a few things that Paul says in Colossians that I think will really uh, put some things together for us. And then... Uh, about that time, we'll probably take a break, and then um, we'll come back and finish with Luke chapter 12, okay? So th thanks again for coming tonight. I, I really have enjoyed this a lot, being with you all, and uh, these, uh, these texts, you might be wondering, like, why these texts? Why, what, <laughs> you know, why not just start with Luke chapter 1 and then go all the way through? These, these texts have really meant a lot to me personally, have really ministered to me been really thankful for the way that they have uh, impacted my life and so uh, as I was thinking about you know what to do these texts just came came right out at me and I thought this will be fun so that that's one way it's really fun for me you know is to be able to get back into these texts and think through them and um and then uh, communicate them to you and um hopefully you're just 
tracking along with what the text is saying. And uh, I, I kind of want to just give it to you, kind of pull me, pull back, and just here's what the text says. Here's some ideas on application, how to think through it, and um, let the Holy Spirit work as Pastor Paul just prayed. Um, okay, so remember chapter 9, verse 51 is a turning point in the narrative. Chapter 9, verse 51, you remember, uh, where is he going now in chapter 9, verse 51? Jerusalem. Yes. Good job, class. Uh, sometimes I ask questions to the teens, and the answer's too easy, and so everyone's like, I'm not saying anything. So, like, it's just, who loves us the most? Like, we know it's Jesus, but we're not, we're not going to say it. Or sometimes I might ask a question that's, like, about the gospel, and I like to say, like, if you, just so you know, if you get this question wrong, you're no longer a Christian, or something like that. Uh, like, oh, I better get the gospel just right. Yeah, uh, so I'll try to ask questions that you can uh, answer uh, really easily. Um, but so in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, uh, there's a turning point in the narrative. He's, Jesus is headed toward Jerusalem. And we talked about last night where you begin to see there the, and, and just preceding that, as he makes that transition in, in the middle of Luke chapter 9, you begin to see the seriousness of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And you see that it's no easy call to follow Christ. It's simple, love God, love neighbor, in that order. Simple, follow me, he says. Deny yourself, take up a cross and follow me. It's a simple concept that even children can understand and believe. Um, But it's not easy, it's difficult. Remember, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So we begin to see that, and we, we track that through, and there was a, uh, an, and behold, then behold, and you get into uh, the two greatest commandments that we talked about last night. We won't rehash all that, but let's keep this in mind as we, as we hit chapter 12 together. Uh, Ch- uh, Jesus is going to say a couple of, like, radical-sounding concepts that might hit us a little bit hard or might be like, well, does he really mean that? And so as we go through this tonight, um, I, want, I want to be careful with the text and uh, we want to keep our eyes there on the text. And what is the text saying? And I, I just want to uh, give that to you. So I'm going to read through a couple of the verses, a few of the verses to start, the first 12 verses. And um, throughout this chapter, though, you, you, you might be wondering, who is Jesus speaking to? So the attentive reader will look at it and say, there's something weird going on about with who Jesus is talking to. And you'll probably pick up on that as I read. And I, I'm, I'm going to set you up for that because I, I don't want you to be distracted by that. Uh, you'll notice that there's a kind of back and forth between who Jesus is speaking to. He's talking to his disciples, and then, it's, so it seems like he's talking to his disciples, there's his disciples, there's him. That's the picture we have in our mind. And then he's interrupted by someone in the crowd, and you're like, where did this crowd come from? I thought it was just him and the disciples. And then he's back talking to just the disciples, it seems like. Even Peter, look with me real quick in verse 41 of chapter 12, even Peter asks this very question, which shows me that there's something going on here that Luke's trying to do. Peter asked this question, verse 41, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? I'm like, that's a great question. That's like the question I had in my mind as I'm reading this. It is going back and forth between the disciples and the crowd, the disciples. Like, what, what's going on here? And um, as we go through Luke, uh, I believe we'll hit this maybe the final night, uh, you'll begin to see... Um, the different categories of people, the crowd becomes like this buffer between those who want to kill Jesus and Jesus. And then towards the end of the Gospel of Luke, there's a breakdown of that buffer because the people that want to kill Jesus get to the inside, right? Judas, they get there. And so you'll begin to see that. So you're starting to feel a little bit of that as we get into this text Um, Now, Luke, in my opinion, does this on purpose, this back and forth, like, who is he talking to? 
He's talking to the disciples? Is he talking to everyone? Then Peter asks that question that's already in my mind. Is he talking to just, he says, us, just the disciples, or is it for all? And I think he does this on purpose because it makes you ask, ask the question, who, who is this for? Who is it for? And Peter asks that. Is, it, is this what he's saying here for believers, for all, for just people that would consider them the tight, close 12? So who is it for? And so I think it's a, it's a rhetorical device, the literary device that Luke is using so that you would analyze the message. You, you would sink down deeper in the message. Now, who is this for? And you try to figure out, is it for the disciples or for the crowds? So you analyze the message and you realize that this message, the answer to that question is yes. It's for everyone. But mainly, when you think about it, the intent, I believe, in this is that you realize it's for me. It's for me. You sink down deep and you think, who is this for? Who is it for? Is it for them or for them? I don't know. It's for me. This is for me. I need to be listening hard to this. Another, another program device that uh, Luke uses to draw the reader in to think about the text, think about it hard, and um, work through that. So I have just a few points for you tonight. And point number one um, is uh, identify with Christ in the midst of persecution. Identify with Christ in the midst of persecution. Difficulty. Okay, let's, let me read the first 12 verses and, um, and then we'll go from there. In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people had gathered that they were trampling one another, okay, that's a lot of people, he began to say to his disciples first, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, Whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed to the housetops. Does that remind you of a text in chapter uh, 10? No, sorry, chapter 8, the parable of the sower. Right after that, he says, the way you hear will not be hidden, is the way I worded that on on Sunday morning. It's going to come out. Okay, let's keep reading, sorry. Verse 4, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who can kill the body, and after that, have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. So I tell you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God? Why? Even the hairs of your head are numbered. Fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before, like that, and when they bring you before synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So you probably picked up on some big themes that are happening in that, uh, hopefully. And um, uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot in this whole chapter that uh, we, we're not going to get to everything. Um, but I want to kind of zoom out a little bit, like I've been doing, zoom out a little bit and talk about what, what is the big picture of what's going on here in Luke chapter 12. So, in Luke chapter 12, you, you begin to see right at the beginning that there's this kind of new, uh, there's a, what I would call a point of departure in the narrative. There's a kind of a new setting, new setup here. You see that at the, at the end of chapter 11, there's like kind of a concluding, summarizing statement in verse, verses 53 and 54. Look, look at that with me. And as he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him, him to speak about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. 
And then kind of a new setting here. In, in, the, in the meantime, when so many thousands of people have gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first. So he begins in his, his journey to Jerusalem, and here you kind of see a new uh, subsection, if you will. This is going to indicate that something new is happening here in the text. And that's why we're starting here in chapter 12, verse 1. Immediately into this section, Christ warns his disciples about the Pharisees. Remember that, you'll remember that the Pharisees are the ones that want to kill him. And we just saw that in verse 53 and 54. They're, they're trying to provoke him. They're lying in wait to catch him. It's something he might say. They want him dead. And they eventually will kill him. Spoiler alert. They will kill him. Um, so they're trying to get at him. And he says to them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Christ teaches that we should that the disciples should beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. The leaven is, it says, which is hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of the Pharisees. They are determining, the Pharisees, the hypocrisy here that, that Jesus is talking about is that these Pharisees are determining uh, their conduct based on their own desires and will. So what they're doing is they're saying, here are some things that people ought to be doing. Um, if you know, uh, um, uh, this is addressed a few times, it's addressed in Galatians as well, uh, where you have the religious leaders who are desiring to follow the Old Testament law in so much, which is good, to follow the Old Testament law, so much so that they add additional rules saying, you have to follow these so that we don't break these. Does that make sense? So if the rule is um, you can't cross this line, they're going to say, well, then we should just back up way over here so that we don't cross that line. Tracking with me? So, what, so then what the Pharisees say is what they, what they then do is say, if you're even a little bit closer... Now you're in sin. They've decided that these man-made ideas about what is sin, that they put together, that those things are sin and not the crossing of the line, if that makes sense to you. So they would have lists of rules, like, for example, look back with me in chapter 11, verse 37. Um, Jesus addresses this exact thing directly. Uh, verse 37, I'm, I'm going to read a few verses here. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside also make the inside? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to the Pharisees. You tithe with mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees. So strong words for the Pharisees. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves, and people walk over them without knowing it. It's... it's, it's it, Jesus saying, like, there's, you've, you've made these rules as hypocrites and said, these are now the standard. Notice, he doesn't simply call the Pharisees hypocrites and move on. He says, beware of their hypocrisy. Beware of their hypocrisy. In other words, be cautious of their hypocrisy because we are also susceptible to this kind of hypocrisy that they have. You're not immune to it because you are my follower is what he's saying. You, just, you may just as well fall into this trap. So beware. He's saying pay attention to this. The NIV translates, translates it. Be on your guard. Um, one commentator uh, defines it like this. To be in a, con a continuous state of readiness to learn from any 
learn of any future danger, need, or error, and to respond appropriately. This is a warning because it could happen to you. It could happen to us. We could fall into this hypocrisy. So he's saying, beware of it, that we're not hypocrites like the Pharisees are. This is a warning because this could happen to us. We, we don't need to create lists for what godliness ought to be that are man-made. Standard comes from the scriptures. And if we decide to make no, this, these are marks of real godliness. Do you find yourself tempted that way? I do. Are you still tempted that way to say, no, but if, if, the, if, if that family were to do this, wow, they must be really godly. Um, you, need to, you need to dress a certain way in order to be godly. You need to ris- listen to the right style of music. And then th- that's a little more godly. You need to go to the right kind of school. People can be really excited about school choice for kids, can't they? You need to read your Bible this many times a day or this many times a week. And then if you do that, you check those boxes, you must be the godliest. And if you can check even more, you must be the godliest because you've done these check boxes you need to go to every youth activity you need to go on a mission trip only associate yourself with quote unquote good people never associate yourself with evil people like for example tax collectors and sinners don't go there don't associate don't be kind of seen with them because that might that might ruin your your reputation you know, people might be asking, what are you doing with those people? Sound familiar? Um, you don't associate with tax or the lowly outcasts of society that we've seen, we're, we have seen and we'll see often in the Gospel of Luke. So his point is, don't make lists in order to judge people's godliness. Where you, draw the, where you decide to draw your line in your personal convictions about a particular topic is not where everyone will dry, draw the line on these kinds of, I like to call, issues of reasoning. As we think through, the Bible will not be exactly clear on where to draw the line on a particular thing. And there, there might be some, uh, some differences of opinion on that. That's okay. Be okay with it. Paul actually hits this hard pretty, it hits this pretty hard in Colossians chapter 2. So, can we turn there for a minute or two? Um, Colossians chapter two, and then we'll take a, take a break. Colossians chapter two. Um, uh, Colossians chapter two, there's a transition in the, the letter at verse six of chapter two. Uh, he starts to move, Paul starts to move towards imperatives, commands, it's not exclusively imperatives and commands, um, but he moves towards that more and more. He gives theology, really a high Christology in the first chapter, uh, if you remember that. And then in chapter two, uh, verse six, he starts to move to, he says, therefore, and he starts to give some commands. If you believe this to be true about Jesus and who he is, therefore, walk this way. Okay, and verse eight he says that, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to what? Human tradition. According to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So those three things ought, ought to be seen together. N- not, they're according, not according, so these, human, these, um, sorry, these ideas, these captive philosophies, these empty deceit, they're according to human tradition, according to elemental spirits, and not according to Christ. So, he's saying, be careful not to be taken captive by those things. And then, skip down with me to verse 16. We're going to get to the end of this chapter, and I'll park there a little bit. Uh, Verse 16 is, so don't let anybody pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or whether to 
uh, or with regard to festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together there, uh, through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. So he's saying, don't let people judge you, don't let people disqualify you because of their opinions on these things. They really think that the, this um, new moon should be celebrated. Or they have a personal conviction about this kind of food or this kind of drink. When people judge you on that, don't let people disqualify you on that. Go to what do the scriptures say. The standard is the scriptures. What does Christ say about these things? So he comes here into verse uh, 20 and he says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. So what is he saying here? He's saying people are going to give you regulations on how to live in their human precepts and regulations. They're their own ideas of what godliness should look like and not God's ideas of what godliness should look like. And they'll say things like, don't handle, don't taste, and they go to the extreme some si- sometimes and say, don't even touch it. Okay? Verse 23. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom. It looks wise to do that. In promoting self-made religion, it looks disciplined to do something like that. It looks wise, it looks disciplined, and asceticism. Asceticism, that word is um, a false humility. Human translation might actually translate it False humility, or humility, just humility. But it's a, it, the idea is a false humility, humility, asceticism. And it looks so wise and disciplined and humble, it even appears to be severe to the body, he says. Wow, you might say, man, that person must be godly because that decision they made looks kind of wise, seems wise. It seems like disciplined, like they got up really early to do that. They must be disciplined. It looks humble, and it looks, it looks like they're even being severe to their own bodies. But look what the next clause says. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. No value? Rules? And regulations that we place on these things are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh? What? So as I was getting ready to preach through this text in Colossians, I'm talking to my pastors about this, and I'm thinking, help me out here. Help me hear that text, have that text, explain that text, without pulling its punch. No value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. None. So when I counsel uh, people, for for example, I I, uh, counsel teens, um, uh, guys a lot with the issue of pornography. Okay, it comes up a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I give them rules. I give them regulations. Usually I go over this text with them to start our council together because I want them to understand why I give them rules and regulations. I might say, okay, first of all, let's talk to your mom and dad about it. Let's specifically talk to dad about it. Let's talk to dad about it if he's around. Let's talk to dad and because um, he's going to be able to help you a lot. And I might put in a regulation like you're not allowed to have... Um, uh, access to the internet after 9 p.m. That seems to be where your trouble area is. Let's pull back after 9 p.m. just to give you some space away from that where there's, there's not quite the temp- temptation as strong because that's what you're kind of used to. I might say something, 
I might say something that might look severe, like, you need to get rid of your cell phone. What? That's like cutting off my arm. Wait, Jesus has something to say about that too. Okay, I'm just like plucking out my eye. Jesus has something to say about that too. They're like, get rid of your cell phone. What if, what if that, that looks like severe. They must be like really humble if they're willing to do that. They, that's like a wise thing to do. It seems like really disciplined that someone would go to that extreme to get rid of their phone. And this text says it has no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. What? It seems like it would work. Well, what's the indulgence of the flesh? Lust. That's the issue. If I give a kid rules and regulations like that, and I don't have him deal with the heart of the matter, if he doesn't deal with lust, his lust is going to show up somewhere else. It's going to show up another way. If he wants to lust, he's going to lust. He'll find a way to lust. We have all the girls wearing all the drapes He's going to find a way to lust. Deal with the heart issue. So, another example, um, in dealing with uh, someone who has, uh, who's an alcoholic, okay? You might add a rule or regulation, don't touch it, or don't taste it, for example. Don't even touch it. Don't even cook with it right now. Don't do it might add that rule and regulation. But if we don't deal with the issue, what would the issue be? Escapism? I want to escape from reality. You know where that often shows up again? Video games. Pornography. Escape from reality. If we don't deal with that issue, that issue is going to come up somewhere else. So, how then does one change? How then does one make changes in our lives? It seems like rules would work. As parents, that's kind of our natural, like, well, if they're doing that, let's, we've got to get a rule on it. Let's get a rule on that. No more doing that. Sweet, I fixed my kid. No, like if you're not going after that kid's heart, dealing with the actual issue, you haven't dealt with the issue. So how does one change? Good question. Um, and the answer there is in Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, in my opinion, I like to word it like this. Repent, renew, and replace. We're not going to get into all of these tonight because I like to get back into Luke chapter 12. Uh, but repent, renew, and replace. It's said really succinctly, in, in my opinion, in Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24. And it says, uh, put off the old self, renew your mind, put on righteousness. Basically. Repent, renew, and replace. Colossians chapter 3 switches the first two. Renew your minds. Look with me. Look at me. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, with, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So the first thing is renew your mind. Fix your mind on God things, heavenly things, righteous things, Think above things. Literally translated, uh, seek above things. Seek things that are above. Seek above things and think above things. Godly things. Then he gets into chapter, uh, verse five. Put to death. So that's your put off. That's your repent. Put to death. Therefore, what is earthly to you? Destroy, kill those things that are earthly to you. And he has two lists of vices. One uh, uh, all about sexual immorality and one about the way that we speak and the heart motivation behind that. And then in verse 12, he says, put on. Here's what you replace that sin with. And the put on is all others oriented. All others oriented. 